what are you talking about? They said, well, you knocked on the one door. The other innovation authors did not. I mean, you walked in through the side door. And I realized that what is in his mind appeared to be a brilliant strategy, in my mind was a serendipitous conversation with my wife. The truth is that all it took was a moment, what I call a click moment. But this now had me wondering, what if this is the case everywhere? What if every single story we hear about career success or organizational success, if we scrape beneath the surface, what we find are serendipitous meetings, unexpected insights, two people talking, an opportunity that you never expected? This intrigued me, and I needed to research this. It turns out over and over and over again, this is true. We got Starbucks. Howard Schultz is the CEO of Starbucks, but not in 1983. He was the director of retail operations. And at that point, Starbucks didn't sell coffee by the cup. They actually sold coffee makers and coffee beans. So he goes to Milan. And when he, he's, he's there for a houseware conference because, you know, they sell houseware. And he's on his way to the conference when he sees this funny little place on the side of the street. And it's an espresso bar. He walks into it. He's never been to an espresso bar before. He's never tasted a coffee latte. The CEO of Starbucks doesn't even know what it is. But then he tastes it, and he starts shivering when he realizes that Starbucks has it all wrong. Because it's not about the coffee beans. It's about this communal, communal sort of experience that you have when you drink coffee with others. Changed the course of that company forever. Microsoft in the late 90s, early, late 80s, early 90s was a successful software company, but it was nowhere near the tech behemoth it was about to become. But that changed when Windows 3.0 came out. How many of you in this room know what I talk about when I say Windows 3.0? I just want to make sure that. I, yeah, it's, it's basically one of the most popular operating systems. It's certainly the most influential operating systems on Earth. It ultimately, uh, when, it, when it hit the market, it spread everywhere. And it became the foundation for what became one of the most executed, most brilliantly executed strategies in history. Microsoft released Windows 3.0, and then they created other software on top of it, like Word and PowerPoint and, and Excel. And then they made it so that you had to upgrade all this stuff, so 3.0 to 3.1 to NT to 95 to 98 to, to Vista. That sucked, but you know, they, <laughs> they, they did all these things, and you had to buy it over and over again. It's just brilliant. But the entire linchpin of their strategy that made them the largest company on the planet came down to Windows, which is why it's rather curious to note that in the late 80s, Microsoft had exactly three people working on Windows out of their 8,000 employees. Why? Because they're going to shut it down. Windows had a fatal memory flaw that made it always crash, and they couldn't fix it despite having spent years trying. Steve Ballmer and Gates says, all right, we're going to take all these people and we're going to Partner up with IBM to create another operating system. It was called OS2. 250 people off from Windows join IBM. Three people left, just the skeleton crew to sort of ease it in to, to, a, to a slow sort of death. So one night, there's a party on the campus, and one of the guys, David Weiss, who's on this team, is there, and he bumps into an old friend of his, Murray Sargent. Now, Murray is visiting the campus for a week. He's on his way to Germany. He's just sold this debugging system to Microsoft. And Murray decides to have some fun at his old friend. Hey, David. Yeah. Windows sucks. I know. Um, you should use my debugging system to fix it. Good idea. And they leave that night. It's 7 PM, June 3rd, and it works. In secret, they fix Windows over the next couple of months. And when Gates finds out, it changes Microsoft's entire strategy. But it came down to that meeting at that party on that night. I gave a talk recently. Actually, this right here is a picture of a Sweden's largest agricultural export product. <laughs> and it's a really remarkable story, because uh, the guy who made it this way is Miguel Ro. He uh, so in the late 70s, absolute vodka 
was nowhere near where it was today. They saw maybe 100,000 cases around the world. The bottle looked like something out of MASH. He came in and changed all that. He invented a new category of vodka called the premium bottle. He redesigned the bottle. He created a cool advertising campaign with pictures from Andy Warhol and others. And he was on stage, and people asked him, how were you able to do this? How were you able to take our brand to become the number third largest spirit brand on the planet? And he said, if I knew that, I'd do it again. But I've been able to do it again. This seems to be this fundamental piece around what it means to drive success that we keep on forgetting about, which is that if success was entirely predictable, and if we could teach that, then we would all be super successful running trillion dollar companies. But there is something about success that keeps on eluding us. And what is this thing? And it is that we, can't, we tend to rely on logic in trying to reach it. 